Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Frankly Speaking with Lynn Franks and Friends. I'm Lynn Franks, your host. And today we're going to be talking about art and activism with, in my opinion, uh, one of the most talented uh, artists who really has worked with activism, with her beliefs, with community, well, for the last 20 years, really. And her work is stunning, incredible. And I wish she'd come and work on my house like she has her own. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. I'll get her to. So Carrie Reichardt, welcome, welcome to Frankly Speaking. I'm such a fan in my kitchen where I'm not sitting right now, I have to say. I have got one of your ceramics up on my wall, which says, fuck the patriarchy, which I'm all for. And there's, <laughs> there's a lot of others I would love to have on my kitchen wall. So... Tell me about what you would we were just talking about, really, which is art and activism, or as you're calling it now, or, or, um, craftivist. And what's your whole feeling about craftivist, being a craftivist? What does that mean, actually? Because it's not a word I'm familiar with. Well, craftivism, the word comes from Betsy Greer. She, um, she invented it, I think she came up with the term in 2003 as a way to kind of have a word that would describe people who use craft and activism and put them together to form craftivism. Okay. And so what, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, do you see yourself making craft rather than an artist? Because for me, it's, I guess there's a no, crossover. No, no I, I'm actually got a degree. I have a first class degree in sculpture. I come from a fine art tradition. I came into doing craft mainly because of my own uh, mental health problems. You know, I had a, a terrible nervous breakdown. In fact, I've had many nervous breakdowns and I'm actually diagnosed with an extreme personality disorder. So I came across craft myself when my first husband suggested that I did a mosaic in my garden and I'd done some stained glass. So I thought, yes. And it was when I started doing craft myself that I realized how self-soothing it is, how it's the most wonderful thing to do. I mean, I think we can see that when you see like at the moment, everyone does colouring in books or everyone has that kind of desire or has found how therapeutic it is to sit there for hours and colour in books. Well, I just discovered that way back in about 98, I discovered that, you know, I could get a design and I could spend hours and I would be lost in just the colour and the shape and just the application. You know, so I came into craft as a form of art therapy. And I think that nearly all of my creative work comes from a position of it being a form of art therapy. But over the years, I've just become more skilled at what I do. And so now I'm in, in, in a very, an amazing position where I get paid to go and do public work. Yeah, which I think is fantastic. We're gonna talk about that a little more in a minute. But you use words, it's not just images. And certainly all the work I've seen of yours, the words are very important and they do express how you feel, whether it's about um, feminism or, or climate change or in, uh, human rights. Would you, I mean, when did that start? Did that start at the same time that these words started no. coming in? No, because I started doing mosaics. I started just uh, playing with tiles, but then I went back to college. I spent eight years at, Richmond Adult College studying how to transfer image onto clay. I spent a very long time learning how to add meaning to, to, to my work because I think when I was at college, I used to do loads of collage. That was the thing that I did because I have no confidence in my ability to draw or paint. And I think I probably would be on the, I am dyslexic. I'm a very visual person. I struggle with the pronunciation of words. I struggle to write. I can't, you know, I think I've always been so visual. And what I did was I've always just taken imagery, taken words, taken things that mean something, and then try to put them together to form a dialogue. Now that's yeah. what I did when I was at college and I was doing my own work. I used to mix text and imagery and that's just de developed because I've been practicing as an artist now since 98. I mean, you know, it's 20, 25 years. It's a very long time and over that time, I've never really changed who I am or what I'm doing or, or how I communicate. I just became very skilled at mosaicing. I've become skilled at ceramics. I've got a whole different mediums and ways that I can communicate. And I have such a belief that 
ceramic and tile and glass is so kind of you know it, it it transcends certain things when people look at a mosaic or they can feel and touch ceramic I think it has a real deep I don't know kind of it's like playing with the earth isn't it so I like to think that it has a real special quality that you can't deny that's why all civilizations have learned how to make clay objects they're beautiful in themselves intrinsically just the glaze just the earth so when you start applying layers to that and layers of meaning and printing on them I think you just make a very rich ceramic tapestry that I'm able to now make and use in public artwork as a vehicle to tell people stories it's you know the basis of most of my work now is the idea of telling stories from below telling the people's history bringing into the foreground and celebrating people, everyday people, everyday heroes, or the struggles that people have had that don't get mentioned. Yeah, and I saw you did that in that fantastic elm tree of life that you've done in Finsbury Park. I come from North London and I've known Finsbury Park Station my whole life. My kids live near there. So it was something really special when I saw you were doing this beautiful image there. So tell us about that because that's got what, exactly what you're talking about, members of the community and well, their stories. Well, that's actually, there's one of two. I'd made that in collaboration with the artist Karen Francesca and her brother, ATM Street Art. And we've been working together as an arts group, as a community arts group since 98. She was my best friend at college and it's her old, older brother. So we have been working as artists for nearly 25 years. And uh, Mark is a fabulous painter and paints indigenous, you know, birds that are becoming extinct. And Karen actually went and did a degree in art therapy so she could add to when she was working with um, people teaching them art. But so those piece has to be seen as something that we all made together. The first one I made was the South Acton Tree of Life, which is around the corner from me on the local estate. And uh, then we were asked we got another commission and we decided to do one for Finsbury Park. And the reason we did the Elm Tree of Life is because obviously uh, Seven Sisters, that street is based on the story of seven sisters that planted seven elm trees around, I think it was a walnut tree. And that's, I did that, not know that's that. going on for centuries and centuries. I got to look into it. I, 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 I went up and down Seven Sisters Road more times yeah, than... No, but that's where the Seven Sisters Amazing. come from. And if you, if, you go, if you go look at my piece of work, we've got lots of pictures of various Seven Sisters doing it, you know, throughout the different, you know, I think in the 19, uh, in the 50s and, you know, going way back. So everything that we do when we try and do public art, we're trying to make it site specific. We're trying to make it very much tell a story, but in the most universally appealing way as possible. And so, I've always felt, and so has Karen and Mark, that nature is one of those things. We always do an awful lot of consultation work. We did three months worth of consultation work for the Finsbury Park job. Karen worked with the well women. She worked with a blind organization. We worked with an elderly daycare center. We worked in the library. We went out, we talked to people, we collected their stories. And so uh, what happened is I print all that onto tiles and that uses all the background and then the tree, which is the tree of life, which is a universal symbol. Do you know what I mean? It's not yeah. that everyone who sees the tree of life sees it and will recognize that. And so, and within the tree of life, in the bottom, in the roots, it's got the names of all the, the bugs or insects or plants that only ever live on an elm tree. You know, so it's really supposed to be talking about the interconnection between us as a planet and also about the roots. And we see the roots as symbolic That's embedded into the community. And so the idea is the history, the oldest history starts at the bottom and then it goes up. That's so beautiful. In my, in, in my um, seed community that I've been working with for a long time, we use the tree of life and the roots are where the women connect and it's their values, which is about creating a better, different world, is how, which is what goes up into the branches. And well, I, I, the women connecting at the roots is one of my... One of my well, it's obvious, isn't it? Because you need yeah. strong foundations. The whole point of anything is that you need strong foundations. So we have the roots as being embedded in the community and in the history and telling it. And so we work very hard to reflect that community. All the information on that piece comes within a five-minute walk of that spot. 
That's I how love I it. Because there was so much history of that area. It's so radical. There's so many amazing things that have happened in that area. But what I did was decided if it was with, after a five minute walk, it wasn't going to be included. And so also within that, there's a border that goes around it. And all those stars were made by local people. Every one of the stars was made in workshops that we had in the local library. And the pattern we, we had printed and then incorporated, there was pattern that represented the different uh, groups of people who'd moved there and made it their homes. There's a lot of Turkish print going on there, or, you know, you know, we deliberately tried to make a piece that didn't matter where you came from or who you were, there would be something that might be recognizable to you or something that you would love or that it would be as appealing, I suppose, to as many people as possible. I love it. Absolutely love it. I haven't been up there since you put it up. So I, that's just one of the reasons I will be going up to see it. It's just if you do, you should walk around the corner because there's a second piece now that I was commissioned to make that was actually commissioned to be made by the people, the family that own all that land. Um, uh, this family, but they're quite a funny family, but it's, it's also quite nice. It's another nice piece around the corner that's got uh, bits of history about the local area. I will. I mean, for me... I'm not the base, greatest expert, but, uh, but I don't know anyone that does the work that you do. Bringing in community, bringing in the, the words for change, and at the same time, the imagery is so wonderful. And of course, you've done it with your own house, which is world famous. You thought, where could I have a big canvas that I could put anything I want up? And I know you invited many, many artists, friends from around the world to contribute. And um, in Chiswick, I I've, I've, again, haven't seen it in real life. I've only seen the pictures but it's and films. It's remarkable. Tell me about your house called the treatment rooms, right? Yes. Well, <coughs> funnily enough, the name comes from the fact that years ago before I did this with my first husband, we got access to go around um, Homerton Mental Hospital when they were closing it down. It had been shut down and we asked if we could film in there as artists. And really, we just went around there to see what it was like. It was awful, terrible place. But uh, I stole the sign from a hospital wall that said treatment room and thought that was really hysterical. And then I came home and I put it on the door of what was my studio. Because I kind of knew even then, I knew then that this is my treatment, the treatment rooms. I go into this room and I do art therapy, you know. So it came that the reason it came from the treatment rooms was this whole idea of it, all of it, creative all our creative outpouring was a form of art therapy for who, who did, whoever came along and helped. But my house is quite funny because my dad was a landlord. He's literally like a Rigsby character. You know, he had all these different <laughs> houses and they were all multi-occupied, absolutely rising damp Rigsby. And this was the house that my parents first married. They came here with my two brothers and they lived in the bay. It lived in a tiny little flat downstairs, rented out all the rooms. They'd moved to the house where I was born, which is just down the road in Chiswick. So this was just one of my dad's properties. But uh, when I was 16, I begged to leave home because my, you know, my father is a difficult person, shall we say, to live with. And um, my sister all lived, she lived in the flat downstairs. My brother had a bed sit and I moved in into what is now my bathroom at the top of the house so and then I lived in all the different rooms as bedsits and then I did move away I went to university I went and lived in another flat and then my sister used to live here and then she moved and then eventually I got into the ground floor flat and then I just started having children and <laughs> eventually taking over the whole house but in, in, in reality I didn't own the house and so I kind of felt like a bit like a squatter in my own family house and, and I um, was doing community mosaics. I was doing public art. I'd just done a big job at um, Harold Hill. And there'd been some steering committee that hadn't let us do things. They wouldn't let us put the symbol of don't burn trees because they said it would incite arson. And it's just like, it was rubbish. It was just oh. like, oh, I can't bear it. And at that, at that very moment, I'd also bought a book called uh, Fantasy Worlds. It was just a book of people who'd done mad things all around the world to their houses. And I just kind of thought, you know what? I think I'll just mosaic my house. They can't tell me what to do then. You know, even though I didn't own it, I just thought I'll mosaic it. And so I just did, I just started doing it. 
And I remember wow. thinking, I remember thinking as I started it, I used to joke to people, oh, it'd probably take me about 20 years. And then it did. Did it <laughs> take 20 years? Because it's, it's a big house with a big frontage. And for those of you who haven't seen it, who listen to this podcast, I really do recommend you Google it and have a look at the pictures of it because it's absolutely remarkable. But then, of course, you did the back of the house too. And that really tells the story of your friend, Louis Ramirez. Yeah. Who, who you lost. Do you want to talk about, Louis? Well, yeah, because what happened is, is that um, in 2000, which is roughly the, it's the same time really that I started to mosaic my house, is that I was, I was doing community art and I picked up a big issue on, on, I was reading the big issue and it had a little advert in the back saying, human rights, could you befriend someone on death row? And I thought, oh yeah, I could. You know, and I did think, oh, Silence of the Lambs, oh, this will be interesting. <laughs> because when I was about 13, I was obsessed with reading about serial killers. I'd always been a fascination into why would anyone do that? Mm. Is, you know, there's just that, how could you, end, you know, just wanting to know. And so I'd seen this advert and thought, well, yeah, I could do this. And so I applied and you just write, they give you a name and you write to them. And then about three weeks later, I got a letter back. And that it was just, it sat on my fireplace because I was, by then I was single with my three-year-old daughter and I'm thinking, what the, what have I done? I've got a letter from death row here. I mean, God, what have I done? And all the kind of normal things that people think, because we do think death row, mass murderers, you, th we, you know, we have some, that's what we're led to believe. But anyway, after about three days, I opened this letter and it just said, oh, hi, Carrie, thanks for your letter. I see you do mosaics. What kind of mosaics do you do? Because I have done some. I'm including a picture of some that you might like. And it was just like Amazing. Humanity, humanity hitting you in the face. All your pre preconceptions just disappearing. And, 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 and then what took place is a really beautiful five year relationship where we we wrote to each other a lot, maybe once a week, maybe or once every couple of weeks. But it was, a, a you know, yeah, a lot. intense, intense relationship and and loads of people always have a very misconceived idea i think about when you write to people on death row what a nice person you are and how you know what you do for them it, but my experience is it's not like that i used to write to lewis about my problems and i used to write in them and say oh, i'm so sorry i'm complaining about my weight or my boyfriends or you know and you're just sitting in a cell waiting to die I feel really really bad and and, and Lewis was an amazing writer he used to write back and say look Carrie don't please because you know when I write to you you give me my humanity because this is where I can be the man that I was outside of prison this gives me something to to give back and so it's a really beautiful receptive relationship was formed where you know he became a very close friend I wrote to him and then after five years, he, they executed him, the murder, you know, this, the, they killed him. And I flew out there to be with him for the two years, the two days before they executed him. I went and sat and visited him in death row in Texas. Wow. And that was the first time you'd met him in person? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I had had quite a fear of flying up until that time. I was really, I'd had a bad time flying once <laughs> and uh, I didn't like flying and I had to overcome a lot of things. But, you know, for me, writing to Lewis was one of the most life-changing things for me because up until that point, I'd suffered an awful lot with mental health problems. Um, and also I had real trouble speaking because I pronounced my words wrong. I really hated speaking. There was a time when me, Karen and Mark, when we do a public art piece and they'd say, does any of the artists want to say anything? We'd all like, hang our heads down and go no I'm not saying anything none of us would speak you know but I think this is one of the things about activism one of the things about doing this type of thing is that it's empowering because you find a voice I'm very good at finding a voice for other people and when I had children I had to find my voice but prior to that I was chronically insecure about things and didn't have an ability in fact I spent my whole life with quinzines and boils and having uh glandular fever and all these things and i'm utterly convinced that the more i found my voice through speaking out for things that i care about and found my voice creatively the less these problems you know i don't have any problems particularly with my throat now yeah no i mean our mind body 
and soul, in my opinion, are just so very closely connected that, you know, we do get reactions like that. And our fear goes back very deep in being heard, being seen. And I think it's also uh, a thing that an awful lot of women particularly suffer from is actually that confidence to be seen and be heard. Uh, And we need it. We need it badly. So talk to me about feminism, because a lot of your work um, goes back quite a long while, really, in your your opinion. I don't even feel confident to talk about feminism anymore <laughs> in the world that we live in. Being... Oh, yes. No, we always have to. We have. Well, what is feminism? I mean, that's the other thing. The thing like... for me is that I'm an old school feminist. I'm sorry I am. I've been brought up in a certain way uh, and I have a certain belief systems. And I'm a product of going to university when it was a polytechnic and it wasn't all universities. And it was when it was free and they pay, gave you a grant. But I went in 88, 87, 88, well, no, 1988, I started my degree. And um, it was just on the tail end of like in the 80s of the feminist art that was exploding everywhere, like Julie, you know, Judy Chicago, or, you know, yeah. I was very influenced by the Gorilla Girls who were like, wow, who's this? You know, I arrived at Leeds not very long after the Yorkshire Ripper had been. Right. And I lived in, in, the, in my road. The bottom of my road was the nightclub pub called The Gaiety, which was very rough. And I'd come from Chiswick, ended up in <laughs> Hare Hills. And uh, so I was incredibly influenced by feminist art of the 80s. Uh, if you were to look at my degree show, it's the most feminist show you'll ever see. It's hysterical because I did all body casting. Uh-huh. And um, I titled all of my work the name I wanted to give it, and then a title that some tutor had said about my work. So I had one that was called um, Every Woman's Dilemma, where I cast five females in their knickers, and then I had a Petra dish embedded into their tummy, which had um, had a type of uh, contraception in it and written on it, your probability of getting pregnant. And then I had these wombs on a chairs, sat in like a doctor's waiting room, and behind it, there was a framed interview where I asked these same five women who'd all had abortions what the experience was like. Hmm. And it was really, you know, and so, and that work was called, yeah, Every Woman's Dilemma or you Just Another Woman Fraternising About Her Womb. <laughs> you know, and I, one of my pieces was called Pretty Woman or You Must Be a Feminist Then. <laughs> Because, you know, it was derided when I was at school, when I was at college. It wasn't yeah. in vogue. It was very much not. But now I know because prior to doing my degree, I did an art foundation. And the summer before that, I'd been sexually assaulted walking home late at night, which for me, I think had been the, one of the things that had created a long, long, lifelong issues. Yeah. You'll never know whether I would have been more confident or whether I wouldn't have... Um, had such mental health problems had that not happened to me it's impossible to know yeah but it definitely was a moment in my life where I went from do you know what I'll do what I like no one tells me nothing I'm not going to be held back because I'm a female to not being able to go out my own bedroom probably for six months you know horrible horrible and and how many women has that happened to besides the world you know it took me at least 15 years to feel comfortable walking to the garage even now I carry keys ready to punch someone you know so that kind of thing that it does to you there's a shift in you there was a shift in me when I was 21 so that this happened I spent my entire foundation basically making work around being attacked without anyone really noticing and then when I went to do my degree I think it was all cathartic art therapy for me yeah every one of my pieces was either about how women were objectified about abortions you know they used to call me Hannibal Lecter at school at college because I cast everyone and I would make them into suits and then I would hang them in a wardrobe in fact the centerpiece of one of the pieces I did for my degree show was a forecast of me laying down that was made in latex and put in a glass coffin surrounded by flowers (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, it was very, very of its time, you know. So I was very, very influenced by these things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to, but I think, do you not agree, even now in today's world, or especially now, it shouldn't be that way, we still do need to hear women's voices. We still... I think we need even more. I think we're up against, you know, I think... That I we agree. Need, 
we need feminism even more now when I see what's happening. Because when I look, when I went to university, I was there protesting against uh, prostitution. And now they give you guides and how to do safe sex safely. This is just like, I know I'm of an older generation, but this is stuff that's like deeply opposed to what my old, my, my views are. Yeah, well, I'm even older generation and it's deeply opposed to my views too. And I just think that we live in a world where we still have so much misogyny and we still live in a world where the people that are in our so-called well, so-called control or our leaders uh, are predominantly men or women that play the men's game so they can be part up there with them. We look at our own government, see that. And we still have so much to do. And that's one of the things I love about your work is the community aspect of it, because for me, the future is about women taking leadership roles in communities, small communities quite often, whether it's, whether it's cities or towns or villages, where we can, through creativity, as much as well-being and as much as the whole nurturing aspects of women when they allow themselves to be safe, um, can really create a societal shift. That's my whole thing. And that's when I look at the multi levels of your art, and that's a, such an important part of it. I mean, the fact that you would go and do this piece of art in Finsbury Park, but make sure there were months of talking to the community, finding out what they want, who they are, what their stories are. For me, that's that makes art so much bigger. I mean, I don't even think that that craftivist is really remotely describes who you are or what you are. I'm not sure that there are words to say it, but I think it's such a such important work. And I know that you work a lot with young people as well, because we've talked before about how can we can do something even together, because I'm working with young people, as you know, as well, uh, in how we can bring them into understanding the, the power of their hands as opposed to just sitting on a screen all day, that they can do these things. So tell me about some of the work you've done with, with young people and in communities generally. It's all over oh, the world now, isn't well, it? Well, the thing is, is, for a time I did nothing but community work. I mean, I even worked in orphanages. I went to Romania for three years in a row and worked wow. in orphanages there at which at that time were the ones that you used to see on on tv you know it was awful terrible terrible and I worked in um St Bernard's Mental Hospital when I first started so I did do an awful lot of community artwork and then I kind of even I suppose I developed my own career I had you know I'm kind of successful in selling art or doing street art and then I did public art and I think partly because of our own artistic ego, there was a time where it was just, I wanted to make the most beautiful public art I could to show the merits of myself as an artist, but it's kind of gone full circle now because now we're trying to, now I've achieved that. It's now I'm trying to incorporate the stars, incorporate the community into that work. And so recently up in Coventry, where I did the front of Paul Bet Meadow bus station, that was in a, you know, that was during a, lockdown these things you know the last couple of years have not been easy so it seemed even more important to try and get people to physically make things and do things so for the Coventry one me and my assistant Sean went to Coventry and in one day we did 90 stars we went to two schools and did like every kid made a clay star and all of those stars were then run up the side of the, of the bus station which was amazing. At the same time, I was doing the Boston Boys, which are two navigational boys that tell the story of by land and by sea in Boston, Boston being Lincolnshire, not America. Uh, but there was no chance to actually work with people there for me because of the lockdown. And so I worked with a local ceramicist there, Greenfield, I think it is, Pottery, who sent in little trays with fish with clay and cutouts and gave it to kids in schools and they got it back and they fired it and they sent it to me and then another 50 people did designs which I had a, a ceramicist then transfer onto fish so on the boy one there's 150 fish made by the local community and on the by land one I had flowers made by all my friends in the mosaic world who sent them in all around the world and so you've got this you know I really like the whole idea of the collective all coming together making little bits or having a little voice and then that becoming a collective voice to you know because i do believe that's how you how you unify people or how you bring them together you know there's a remarkable thing that happens when you make things with people if you bring in a group i'll tell you a good example i did um i did a six-week project up in birmingham at the custard factory with craft space which was DIY and craftivism. 
where they put a call out for young people between the ages of 16 and 24 who I had an interest in mental health, which generally meant they had problems with mental health, though not all of them, but it was just, they put that out. And so we had a small group of young people that came that in the first week sat in a circle and couldn't make eye contact they couldn't some of them couldn't even say what their name is you know when you go around and say hi i'm so and so you know very very you know a, a group of young people all with a lot of problems you know social anxiety and things but over this six weeks two it was two two days a week for i think six weeks we ran all these craftivist things and and craftivism. I got them to um, cross stitch messages and then run around and stick them up around Birmingham. And then we did cross stitch. We did uh, don't worry, be happy on a bridge. You know, they all sat there together sewing it. And a guard pr came along and said, you can't be doing this. And I was like, yeah, really? We've got permission, go find management, it's fine. And they were all so excited, the idea of them breaking the law. They're all so excited about, you know, it was all so empowering for them. But it was an amazing project. And then over the six weeks at the end of it, we took over the basement of a, a coffee shop and, and they invited the public in and this same group of young people sat there and taught strangers how to do craftivism. Oh my God. You oh, know, that's and, brilliant. And part of the, one of the sadness, one of the terrible things about that course is that one of the reasons it was successful, tragically, is because A, it was very well sought out and it was very well, there was a lot of us to help them and they had young people and it did a lot with using you know peer people who are only much, a little bit older helping people younger than them but because they gave these young people their bus fares and their dinner which enabled them to do the project in the first place because what we did discover is that poverty was one of the main factors that was the thing that was really killing all these kids you know yeah. the lack of opportunities yeah, you know, and, and it was just it's sad because it was just a little thing that happened and it proved the point. It proved that if you brought all these people together, these young people that gave them that little opportunity, gave them some food, gave them their fair money, put them in a place together, let them be creative. It had wonders for their mental health and that they were extremely, you know, capable young people. Oh, I'm, I well, I hope we can persuade you to come back down southwest at some point when we start this project off in Somerset, but all send me instructions how to do it. But I think the fact that you've had your own mental health issues, which you've been talking about and your own kind of uh, story really has given you much more understanding when you're working with other, with young people now, yeah. where they're coming from, it must do, it must do. Absolutely, absolutely. I think you'll find that me and Karen and Mark and nearly all the people that I work with in the Treatment Room Collective understand how the power of art to have, to have healed themselves you know that's why we believe in it so passionately you know my life has been saved by art for sure I used to be a chronic self-harmer I used to I've OD'd about four times I've cut my wrists twice you know I come from a position of, of acute having acute mental health problems and absolutely you know using art as a way to communicate at times when I really couldn't and so yeah. now I've had therapy for five years and I'm a very different person, but it means I, I am very aware and I've got empathy and understanding of how powerful creativity is. It's beautiful. So I started off this talk with you talking to you about art and activism, which is what I came in thinking we were going to be talking about. But really what we're talking about is art as a creative healer. That's what it is, whether it be with human rights, let's go back to the subjects we were talking about, with human rights or, or with the environment or really just people in community. It's about healing and it's about using all these amazing facilities, whether it's sewing cross-stitch or working with clay, all the things you've talked about that you work with as part of the healing. And I suppose the fact that you do call your beautiful house the treatment rooms and the fact that you do talk about, um, I guess, the, 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 the work it was, the way it was for you as a therapy, uh, it really brings it back to one thing. It's very interesting. It's, so it started off this conversation as one way I thought it was going to run. But really, when you get to the grassroots of what you are all about and your work is all about, it's about healing. And it's about healing in the community. And it's about healing young people. And it's about working collectively, which yeah. for me is what the future is all about. So I'm going to ask you, as I end all my podcasts with the question, 
How do you see the future? What could the future look like to you? What could it and what it's going to? I well, don't let's, let's say, well, you see, that interesting as an artist, I, I think, unless we create the vision, whether it's visual or whether it's words or whatever it is, we're never going to make it what we want it to be. We have to, we have to envisage it, envisage it, envision, I can't even say it. Anyway, well, that's what we have to do. And then we have to see how we can consciously uh, take it towards that, that place, that picture that we've created. Because if we don't, and if we only see the dark and the mess that the world is currently in, that's indeed how it yeah. will stay. I'm sure Definitely. I mean, for me personally, I'm thinking of hopefully moving to your neck of the wood, actually. To oh, oh yay! Commonly more <laughs> to the Bristol side. But personally, I would like to go and set up, live with my friend. I've always joked about the fact that we're going to have like an old people's home, but it's going to be like an arts commune where we can share our skills with the next generation. And, you know, beautiful. Um, yeah. I mean, I've always been if trouble is, as I'm a Londoner and I've always lived in London. So it's hard for me to envision not being in this house because I've been here my whole life. But I love the idea of moving somewhere where people can come together and we can like build like art houses and, you know, um, and I'd, I'd love to be that artist that made the entire mosaic environment, you know. But uh, as as people, I think like you, I think we're going to have to come together collectively. It's more and more important that we do. I think things may well start to go more local, you know, that it is to do with, you know, being, it's difficult in London, but, you know, but to be aware of your neighbours and to be aware of people in your local community and to reach out and to do things you know collectively together yeah. I think the trouble is for women is that we've been sold a lie that we can have it all that we can have work and we can have kids and we can do everything and I think the trouble is is women are the most capable of being the ones who nurture and, and bring everyone together but then we're also the most put upon you know yeah. You know, we can't be world leaders because we usually we're too busy getting the laundry, you know, we, that is a, you know, and if you don't, then you have this endless guilt trip because you're not the mother that's at home making pie. Do you see what I mean? You know, I, I know exactly what you mean, because I'm constantly getting blamed from my children that I wasn't that mother at home making the pie. But um, I, they still got fed and had a roof over their head. They had a pretty good time. <laughs> and and yeah, now... I See, that's why the wise when we move on and our children get older I don't know how old your kids are now but that gives us the space and the time really that we can move into that powerful place no definitely I totally agree with that you know that's why I have a like a, my alter ego is called the unfit mother <laughs> I think, yeah because my, you know I think it's pretty hard to be anything but if you're the breadwinner and and you're the person if you especially if you've been bringing up your kids on your own you know that that's it's very difficult to be anything other than that. You know, I always used to joke that as soon as you had a baby, you should have guilty stamped on your forehead. Because you, there's an end, you know, for me, there was always a real big sense of guilt because I'm on the one hand, I know that I need to create. It's not just, I want to work. It's that that's what self soothes me. You yeah. know, what deals yeah. with my mental health issues. So yeah. those aching eight hours a day wasn't for money or fame. It was to just keep sane. And so, you know, but that meant I wasn't all around with my kids all the time, you yeah. know. But luckily, I think, like you were saying, my children are older and every single one of them is now like, you know, come full circle. I think my daughter now just, she's very driven and, and, and you know, I like to think, well, I, I was trying to be that role model too. Yeah, how exactly. How old is your daughter now? Uh, my oldest is 25, just turned 25. My son is 19 and my youngest is 16. All right, yeah. Now that's it. They the, When they get to a certain age, I would like to think in my children's case, I'm not sure, but they actually respect us for what we've done and how we've gone forward and how we've juggled the way we have. And it may mean we weren't always around when they perhaps wanted us to be, but we were showing them an example of what can be. And, both so, might... and the trouble is, is that once you do get into your prone age or your, you know, the, that stage yeah, where yeah. you've got the confidence, you've kind of realized your own history, you've got more time. It's that that's when they try to shut you up, isn't it? And burn you as well. Well, that's what they used to do. I mean, but we talked about that a lot here in my community last week. So we had two very powerful witches visiting us who were my podcast last week. 
Um, and we were talking about, you know, the, what happened 500 years ago, then they would shut us up by the healers and the herbalists and the wise women would get tortured oh, and bridal. drowned and put on the fire. And now 500 years back, here we are. And you know what? We're not going anywhere. Now we're ready to step in our power. And that's that's why I live in this area that I live in. I know that. So it's interesting. We've ended up talking about what we were talking about last week, uh, or I was talking about last week. I think that is it. We are now the crones. We are the wise women, which means wise women. And whether you as a brilliant artist um, or whether me with more work I do and the work that we're all doing, we, we chose to be here now to be the change makers and to get that future sorted out for the young people and the generations to come. So that's brilliant. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. All right. So Carrie Reichardt, that is fantastic. I, I'm really, that's so exciting and just so fantastic. And as I said, as a podcast, people are not going to see all the brilliant mosaics you do. So all of you listening, go online and check out Carrie's work because you're going to love it. And um, and I hope I'll see you down here in the Southwest very soon. So thank you so I'll, much. I'll that when I'm there. Lots of love. Bye. One of the many things I love about Carrie's work is how she brings messaging into her creativity. So I would like to suggest a special exercise you may want to do yourself as a result of being inspired by her story. Why not create a piece of art yourself with some strong messaging? I know you have a creative gift. So whether you want to do a painting or maybe like Carrie could do some ceramics or mosaics with broken bits of china, why not bring those two ideas of a message about something you are passionate about and the creativity, the colour and the tools that you wish to use and do something very special to hang on your kitchen wall. Thank you so much for listening and taking part. Remember, we'll be putting up episodes in this new series every two weeks and I do hope you will join us again. If you like what you hear and want to learn more practical methods to help you plant the seeds in your own journey of empowerment and creative leadership, then please subscribe to this podcast, rate and review. Also, make sure you join our Seed Network, our community if you haven't already, and together with thousands of like-minded women, make friends, promote your business, share your stories and experiences. Visit seednetwork.com to find out more. Until then, I'll see you next time.